kind of two halves, if you like. My half will be a little more conceptual, whereas Maddie's half will be a little more practical. Uh, so hope that's okay. But if we jump in, Reach Australia uh, loves to use the language of inputs, outputs, and ecosystems. And so if we're thinking about uh, community today, we really want to start by thinking, okay, well, what exactly is the output that we're after, right? What is the kind of community that God wants us to build? Uh, what are the inputs? So what helps us to achieve those outputs? And I also want to think about the role that the whole ecosystem of the church plays in helping us achieve those outcomes. So that's kind of the three sections that we're going to be exploring in this first half. And so if we jump into outputs, uh, we're really talking here about the kind of church community that we want to see. And so you're going to see a slide come up in a moment, uh, because I often find it helpful uh, to compare what a big crowd might look like compared to a biblical church. And so let's just contrast uh, some of the differences between a big crowd, which maybe gathers to watch a sports game, and a biblical church, which maybe on a Sunday is gathering together to worship God. And so kind of if we go left to right as we work our way down, uh, we've got the big crowd. What do they do? Well, a big crowd gathers to attend an event, whereas a biblical church uh, is a group of people who actually belong to a community. A big crowd gathers for entertainment, you know, maybe education, depending on the event, whereas a biblical church gathers for edification and or evangelism, again, depending on the event. Uh, a big crowd, probably only loosely united by a common interest. A biblical church, spiritually united by a common saviour. Uh, a big crowd don't love and serve other members, whereas a biblical church does love and serve other members. A um, big crowd exists really to glorify humans by living for and praising them, whereas a biblical church uh, glorifies God by living for and praising Him. And so if all you did, thanks for that slide, uh, if all you did was really just observe um, the event, you know, the, the sports game or the Sunday service, on the outside a lot of it kind of may look similar, uh, especially if it's a slightly larger church. But the more you dig beneath the surface, I think the more you're going to come to see that the Sunday surface is really just the tip of the iceberg of the community that exists in a biblical church. And so let's try and flesh that out a bit. Um, Jesus says that the distinguishing characteristic of Christian communities is that we will have love for one another. So very famous verse, at John 13, 35, Jesus says, by this, Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Right, so the distinguishing characteristic of a biblical community, a church, ought to be our love for one another. The thing is, um, this one another command that Jesus gives here is actually just one of 59 different one another commands in the Bible. Um, 15, we're going to see a slide here in a second, but uh, 15 of those commands are explicit commands to love other people, but then there's a whole bunch of other commands that are given, one another commands, which I think kind of put flesh on the bones of what it actually means to love one another. And so uh, if I, I think it, when it comes to you know what kind of community is it that we're trying to build, uh, or what, what output do we want to pursue as you know the community people? we really want to be trying to push towards a community that is living out these one another commands. And so if you're a visual person, I think um, I've tried to pull all of them together. Uh, and, and really what you get is um, a community of forgiven sinners uh, characterized by loving actions and loving attitudes. And so loving actions, you know, we're told to carry one another's burdens, to serve one another, submit to one another, teach one another. Or over on the right, loving attitudes, we're called to be devoted to one another, honour one another, accept one another, have equal concern for one another. Um, in other words, that is the output, right? If, if you ask what is the goal, what's the target that we as community people are trying to push towards, we want churches that are marked by this loving one another. Thanks for that slide. So that's outputs. Now we'll go into, okay, well, what's the input that we're trying to push towards? And really, the, the input question is going, okay, um, what can we do 
in order to achieve the output that we've just described, you know, this uh, community of forgiven sinners characterized by loving attitudes, loving actions, what can we do to, to pursue that? I want to suggest there are three things that are critical to achieve this. The first and the most foundational is the Word of God. And so I think you see this beautifully illustrated in the, kind of, uh, the account of the early church in Acts chapter 2. So you're probably familiar with Acts 2. Uh, it's Pentecost. The Apostle Paul, uh, sorry, Peter, preaches and uh, 3,000 people get converted. They repent. They receive the Holy Spirit. And then at the end of Acts 2, you've got this beautiful picture of a Christian community as they're uh, devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and prayer, and uh, they're sharing with one another as each has need. And uh, it, it is this beautiful picture of Christian community. Uh, in other words, it's the Word of God that gives birth to that kind of community. And so um, if you want an ever-growing community of forgiven sinners characterized by loving attitudes and loving actions, the first and most foundational thing you can do is uh, preach and teach the Word of God. And so uh, if you don't, all you're going to have is a big crowd because uh, it's the Word of God that builds the church and uh, leads to this kind of community. However, uh, I think we're going to be naive if we think, well, that's actually all we need. Um, and therefore, I want to suggest we also need two other things. I'll, I'll group these together. The two other things we need as inputs is a team of helpers. Uh, so I know some of you said, you know, you're the, um, the only paid ministry staff. That's great. You need to try and gather around you a team of helpers, uh, volunteers, uh, to, to help you in this work. And then second of all, we also need, or thirdly, if you like, uh, some basic systems and structures. And the reason I say this is because as you read the narrative in Acts, it's not very long before the beautiful community of Acts 2 is sullied by the deceitfulness of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5, and then uh, is kind of blocked, if you like, or they get into um, problems with the unequal distribution of food to the Greek widows in Acts 6. In other words, as beautiful as the early church in Acts 2 was, it's not long before human sin and actually the size of the church get in the way and uh, kind of undermine, if you like, the, the beautiful community that the Word, had got, the Word of God has built. Now, um, for the sake of time, we're not going to go look through the passages, but uh, I'm sure you're vaguely familiar with them anyway. Uh, certainly the Acts 6 passage, if you know what is the apostles' solution to the unequal distribution of food, what do they do? Well, they say it's not right for us to give up waiting on tables, sorry, to give up the word of God for waiting on tables. So let's recruit seven other men, kind of appoint them to look after the food waiting so that we can keep to the ministry of preaching and praying. In other words, what they basically do is um, get a team of helpers and build in quite a simple you know, structure of, of, into their leadership system in order to help the whole thing flourish. And so what's the result? Well, Acts 6 tells us that the word of God continues to spread, and we presume the community, which was so beautiful back in chapter 2, probably continues to flourish now that they've recruited some helpers. Now, uh, all that to say, if you want that output, which we're pursuing in an ever-growing community of uh, forgiven uh, sinners, characterized by loving attitudes, loving actions, uh, you need, I think, at least three things. Number one, and most foundationally, you need the Word of God. You also, number two, need a team of helpers, you know, a little like the uh, apostles gathered together, the seven uh, people to lay on tables. And then third, you also need some basic systems and structures. Uh, Maddie, in our second half, is actually just going to help us think practically about what those structures might be. Um, but before we do, let me finish by uh, chatting about the uh, ecosystems. Because I think a handful of you here, except maybe one or two, uh, are people who have maybe been asked by your senior minister, your senior pastor, to oversee membership or community or maybe church integration or whatever you want to call it at your church. Uh, if that's the case, uh, then I think it's helpful to be aware that you've probably been tasked with pursuing an outcome or a purpose which is much broader than the actual levers you've been given control over. 
Uh, now, I know that's a little bit of jargon there, so let me try and give you some examples. Uh, let's take the Word of God. Right, we've just established that the key and most foundational input for building these communities is the Word of God. And yet my hunch is many of you won't actually be responsible for preaching week in, week out, or for writing community group study, Bible studies for your church. In other words, you don't actually have control over the key input which is going to result in these biblical communities that we're trying to create. Or take pastoral care. And I'll just speak uh, using Grace City as an example here. Um, we at Grace City expect the bulk of kind of uh, low-level to maybe mid-level pastoral care to take place in our midweek small groups. Like we call them community groups. And so if someone has a baby, um, we're hoping and praying and kind of encouraging our groups to do up a meal roster to support and care for that particular family. Or if someone is sick or experiencing a death in the family, uh, a lot of the time we're, we're asking our community groups to get around that person and care for them and love them. In other words, um, our community groups really end up being one of the primary places in the life of our church where this biblical community actually gets lived out on a week-to-week -week basis. But here's the thing. At least at our church, again, it might be different somewhere else, but at least at our church, our membership person doesn't oversee community groups. Rather, our maturity person oversees community groups. Now, we've got our own reasons for doing that, uh, but what it does mean is that our membership person doesn't have direct control over a key lever, a key area of church, where this biblical community gets lived out on a week-to-week -week basis. So, you say, how is any of that relevant to ecosystems? Because that's what we're talking about here. Well, I think you want to try and do two things. If you've been tasked with pursuing this um, outcome of building a biblical community, I think you want to do two things. Uh, first of all, I think you need to think hard about the entire ecosystem of your church, right? everything that's involved. So from the people, to the building, to the services, to the systems, the structures, the aesthetics of everything that's going on, and ask the question, is this particular thing helping or is it hindering the uh, community that we're trying to build here and how can we improve it? So is it helping or hindering all the different elements? But then the second and equally important question you need to ask is, is this something that I have direct control over or is it something that I can merely influence? And so for example, again, let me just use Grace City as an example. Our membership person at our church has direct control over our welcoming teams, you know, our cafe or kind of foyer time before and after church, uh, our follow-up systems, you know, emails, phone calls, that kind of stuff. Um, they also kind of oversee some of the higher level care issues that maybe can't be taken care of in our community groups. They've got control over those, and so all of those end up being levers that they can pull in order to pursue this um, outcome of biblical community. On the other hand, there's a whole bunch of other important areas of church where they don't have control, but they can influence. And I, I constantly want to keep reminding them of this. You see, I would love it when my membership person comes up to me as the person who's primarily responsible about preaching calendar and say, Tim, you know, I think we need a series or you need to address the one another commands more because I'm seeing a failure of our people to really care for and love one another properly. Or if our membership person goes and talks to the maturity person, the person in charge of our small groups, and says, hey, I'm noticing that our groups aren't really living out this kind of ideal of caring for one another. Is there something that we can do to maybe help them with that? Can I help you think about something? Or maybe they speak to the person overseeing our uh, ministry area and say, hey, you know, I've noticed that uh, you've just kind of rostered on people randomly. Have, have you thought about pulling them together and putting teams together? Because maybe the team idea will actually help them uh, both to build a sense of community and it will also help the ministry. Again, a church is an ecosystem full of all sorts of stuff which will either help or hinder the kind of communities that we're trying to build. And so our job as leaders is really to do everything we can to make sure that everything is working towards uh, growing that um, uh, ever growing community of forgiven sinners who are characterized by loving attitudes and loving actions. So there you go, there's
Uh, my first section, as I said, it, it's mainly conceptual, but I think it's helpful just to get clear on what's the outputs, biblical community, what's the inputs, uh, the Word of God, team of helpers, and uh, some systems and structures, and then paying attention to the whole ecosystem. What can I control, and what merely might I just seek to influence? 